Yes. The Gospel is recorded by the Apostle John 21. And I'd like for us, if we would, this afternoon to begin at the, uh, verse 3. And I'm going to ask you if you would stand today in honor of the reading of God's Word. Amen. Some folks don't think us queer folk know how to honor God. Come on now. Amen. I'm here to tell you that I can love Him as much as you can. Come on now. I can honor Him as much as you can. And I'll tell you another thing I can do. I can serve Him with every bit as much fervor as you can. Amen. Praise God. John chapter 21, beginning at verse 3. The word of the Lord reads in this fashion. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, uh, we're going with you also. I'm reading, by the way, this afternoon from the New King James Version so that it's a little bit easier uh, reading than the Old King James. They said to him, we're going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you caught anything? Have you any food? And they answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land, full of large fish, 153, and although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Knowing it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Amen. I'm going to talk to you today about some a very unusual topic, I imagine, for the text I've just read, and you all know I tend to do that a lot throw you some real zingers and it takes a while for you to, to get it come around. Amen. But I want to talk about unconditionally guaranteed. Amen. Unconditionally guaranteed. Would you bow your heads with me? Master, we love you today, and we thank you, God, for this opportunity to be in this place. Lord, you're so gracious. Every time, regardless of the number, you always meet with us. You always allow us the joy and the pleasure of your company, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And God, even when we come in for Bible study on Wednesday night, we feel your presence in this place as we uh, delve into the Word of God and desire to know more and more about you, desire to know how to serve you better. Master, Master, today it's a gloomy day on the outside, but it's a bright day on the inside. For the sun of all glory is shining this afternoon. And we just ask God that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would rest in this place. Lord, let every word that is spoken at this moment uh, be anointed by your Spirit, that it might find its way to the deepest portion of our heart. God, that it might inspire us in a way that we've never been inspired before. Lord, that we might leave this place with a greater desire to serve you knowing who we are, but more importantly, knowing who you are. For Master, today we ask it all in the wonderful, lovely name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated today. Amen. I'm going to get like right into this real quick. We'll keep it short today. Amen. One of the most exciting things about the gospel of Jesus Christ 
and the love of God and the grace of God, one of the most exciting things about it is that it is available to everybody who will have it. Amen. You see, there was never a condition put on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, whosoever will, let him come. Hallelujah. He said to the disciples this day, as they were coming off the boat, come on and eat. He didn't say, Peter, come and eat, and the rest of them had to stay behind because they didn't react to seeing him the way that Peter had. Hello now. Some folks think that because they act like they love God more, that they deserve to get more from God. Hello now. Honey, I don't care how you act. I don't care how you behave. I don't care if you run around with a habit and a long headpiece and you know you've got clothing down to your ankles and you're wearing sandals and you look like some kind of an idiot that crawled out of the 1800s. My friend, you have no more access to God today than a single individual in this room. Hallelujah. Because it's not about religiosity. It's not about living out uh, this existence that... Uh, supposedly proves and exhibits how much you love God. How many people look at Sister Mary Catherine? Oh, she must really love God. I mean, look at her. She's a nun. You know, after all, nuns love the Lord more than everybody else does. Hello now. What about Brother Talbot over there? running around in his little habit and his little sandals. He must really love God to live like that. Doesn't have to love God to live like that. You can be half an idiot and live like that. Come on now. I'm just telling it plain. Amen. See, folks, we tend to, we tend to equate things sometimes all backwards. Here was Peter, didn't even have clothes on. He saw Jesus on the shore. He jumped off the boat and swam the shore half naked. Everybody else just acted like a normal, intelligent person and said, we'll get on the dinghy and row ourselves in. Thank you. Hello. Does that mean that Peter was more excited to see Jesus than the others were? Does that mean that Peter loved the Lord more than the others did? No. It meant that Peter was more impetuous than the others were. Amen. But you see, when they all arrived at the shore, the payoff was, Jesus said, all of you, every one of you, regardless of whether you jumped overboard and swam or whether you stayed on the boat and rode yourself in, all of you, come on now, it's time to eat. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Isn't it wonderful that the love of God and the grace of God and the salvation of God is available to everybody? Regardless of how we re respond to it, regardless of how we react to it, it's there for all. Amen. <clears throat> People in our community need to come to this revelation. But you know what? People in, in, in the mainline circles need to come to this revelation as well. <laughs> Come on now. Amen. Because as soon as they get it through their head, God can start using them and blessing them and reaching out to people that need God. Hello now. Instead of them running through, you know, instead of them running through the country clubs trying to find new members. Hello now. Maybe they'll go to the hospitals. Jesus said, unless you're sick, you don't need a doctor. I'm here to tell you there's a lot of hurt, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of anguish in the gay, lesbian, transgender communities. If there's ever a community that needs God, it's us. Amen. We need God. And what kills me is, if the church is condemning and criticizing instead of offering hope and help, hello now, my Lord have mercy. So you see, we're not the only ones that need to understand today that God's love and His grace and His mercy and His salvation is unconditionally guaranteed. What's guaranteed? I'll tell you what's guaranteed. It's guaranteed that it's unconditional. Did you hear me now? I love those products on television, a bunch of garbage. But they're trying to get you to buy it, you know. So what they do is they tell you that uh, if you don't like this, if it doesn't work for you just exactly the way, of course it never does work just exactly the way that you see it on TV, but if it doesn't work for you, it's unconditionally guaranteed. All you got to do is ship it right back to us and, and we'll refund your money. 
Of course, what they don't tell you is the shipping and handling charge, which is always incredibly inflated to begin with, you know. Five ninety-five to ship something, uh, Bruno, that it cost me a dollar and a half to ship. Mm-hmm. But see, they get away with it because they got that other word in there, handling. So for the lady at the, at the order center to go, oh, this fellow wants this, okay, slap a label on it, poof, that just cost you four bucks. <laughs> And what they don't tell you is, they don't refund your shipping and handling, hello now, and they sure enough don't pay for it to go back, so now you have done wasted nine or ten bucks on something that you don't even want. Probably a 1995 item to begin with, a piece of garbage, but it's unconditionally guaranteed, Harry, any, for any reason you can send it back. But I'm not talking today about an unconditional guarantee. I'm talking about the fact that God's grace and His mercy and His love and His salvation is available to one and all unconditionally. And that's guaranteed. Amen. You got me now? Amen. I want to make sure that title gets in there. I want to make sure we understand where the preacher's coming from. You know, as human beings, we're so accustomed uh, to... So many things in life being conditional. I'll see you on Wednesday. We'll go play golf. If it don't rain. <coughs> Oops. Condition there. If it don't rain. Now if it rains, guess what? You ain't going to play golf. Amen. Of course, then you got the fellow who was so madly in love with his girl that he said, you know, I'd swim the, the deepest ocean and I'd climb the highest mountain and I'd crawl through the deepest valley in order to be with you. And she was just <sighs> so taken with his sweet words. He said, I'll be there Wednesday if it don't rain. <laughs> I'll go see my mom on Friday if I can get the day off. You see, life's full of... We, 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 we tend to attach conditions to a lot of things, don't we? Amen. We're, we're accustomed to seeing things with conditions attached to them. Many of us get into relationships and we find that before too long, that love that is so wonderful and so sweet and, and so precious... Is also conditional. Hello now. It's there for us as long as we're acting right. As long as we're doing and saying and being what our partner wants us to do, say and be. Hello now. I know I'm not the only one been there. Come on now. You see? So, so as human beings, we have a bad habit sometimes of seeing things in a manner that is consistent with our experience. And our experience is that in life, all too often, uh, so many things are built upon a conditional foundation. And therefore, we look at God and we anticipate that God's love and His mercy and His grace and His salvation is also conditional. Hello. You know why? Because we always try to bring God down to man's level. We try to equate God with humanity. Hello now. If I, if I go to another church and hear a preacher tell me how God's just like me, I'm going to spit my teeth out of my head. Amen. God ain't nothing like me. You're listening to me today. My Bible said as far as the east is from the west, that's how different God does things from the way I do things. He said as far as the heavens are from the earth, that's how much higher, that's how much better, that's how much more clearly I see things and understand things. And yet, you go into churches and the preacher get up there and he'll tell you, well, God's a loving father and just like a loving father here on earth, he's going to whoop your butt silly if you don't act right. Come on now, you know I'm telling the truth. See, we love to equate God with human characteristics. We love to see God in human terms. Amen. 
And so many times you go to church and you hear the preacher telling us how just like a father would do this, or just like a boss would do this, or just like a so-and-so would do this, that's how God does it. Honey, God don't operate anywhere near like that. Hallelujah. God is dealing with us unconditionally. Hallelujah. He is not like us. He does not fire us because we don't do our job right. Hello now. He does not fire us because we don't get to work on time. He does not fire us because he doesn't like the way we're dressed. Hallelujah. He does not divorce us because you got stinky feet or your breath smells in the morning. Come on now. Or you don't compliment him enough. Hello now. I'm here to tell you when God marries the sinner, when God marries the unbeliever, he he is married for eternity. Hallelujah. He's there to stay. He's not going anywhere. You can abuse him. You can mistreat him. Uh, my friend, you can insult him. But he's going to stand by you. Because the moment you need him, all you got to do is whisper his name. And he will be there. Yeah. Glory to God. Woo, glory. Oh, Bruno, if only we can get it into our mind that God's love and His grace is unconditional. And I guarantee it today. Hallelujah. Mm. Glory to God. If we can get that into our spirit, i tell you what it does. It doesn't give you a right to go out and be a fool and act up and do all the wrong things. My God, no. But it takes the pressure off. Come on now. So that when you're trying to do the right thing and you don't quite make it sometimes, you have the courage to dust yourself off, get up on your feet again, and try it all over. Hallelujah. Instead of thinking, oh, I failed now. God doesn't want me anymore. God won't have me anymore. I've done the wrong thing. My, God's love for me is conditional, and I have just broken the condition. Hello now. Hmm. Amen. Some people say, brother, you're just trying to get people a license to sin. Honey, I hate to tell you, you don't need a license to sin. You may need a license to get married. You may need a license to fish. You may need a license to carry a gun or go hunting. But you don't need a license to sin. Amen. Amen. Good heavens. You ever seen a baby born with a marriage license in his hand? I don't think so. But there ain't a child in the world who isn't born with a sin license stamped into his forehead. Hello now. Shaping in sin. Born in iniquity. Come on, that's what my Bible says. Well, preacher preaching that affirming message you preach. All you're doing is giving people a license to sin. Is that so? I said, no, I'm not giving them a license to sin. But I'll tell you what I am doing. I'm helping to keep them on the straight and the narrow by taking the pressure off that doesn't need to be on them. Hello now. Help them understand that the love of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God and God's salvation are unconditionally guaranteed. Unconditional. God don't put conditions. There's no if there's no if in John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life hallelujah oh glory to God there's no if in there glory to God there's no if up in there glory I'm telling you friend there's no condition attached to that think about it now come on now it don't say for God so loved the world that whoever straight no, it don't say that. <laughs> Woo! That means whosoever meaneth me. <laughs> that means I'm included. That means that I'm part of the package. I can come in on that clause. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Woo! Michael, I'm telling you. See, around here, if you can't get excited, then something wrong with you, amen, because the preacher gets excited. <laughs> I get excited. I get excited thinking, you know, the truth of God is the most exciting thing ever going to come across your lips. It's the most exciting thing you're ever going to hear with your ears. Amen. It's enough. My mother said sometime, she said, when I listen to some of those tapes of yours, and my mother, bless her heart, going to a Southern Baptist church down there in Texas, hadn't been in a Pentecostal church in a while. 
She said, I want to jump up out of my bed and run in circles. Said, I just don't know what to do with the energy. I don't know what to do. Said, then, said you're preaching it, and my God, it just goes through me like lightning. Amen. Glory. Because the truth of God, the gospel, y'all have heard me say this before, the gospel, it means good news, good news, good news. When you're hearing it, it should fall on your ears like good news. When I'm telling it, I should be telling it with a happy heart because it's good news. Glory. Woo, glory. Let me tell you, the Christian church ought to be the most positive and exciting and uplifting and inspirational uh, organization on the face of planet Earth. Glory to God. We ought to have a reputation of preaching people who are backslid and hell bound uh, into a happy, hallelujah experience. Amen. Glory. Forget this mess about getting in the pulpit and banging people over the head with their faults, with their misgivings, with their shortcomings. Oh, don't you bang them over the head, preacher. The devil's been doing that all week. Come on now. For God's sake, preach the good news and get them into a happy state on the highway of holiness. Glory to God. My Lord, have mercy. My Bible said in Isaiah, oh, and a way shall be there. <laughs> and there shall be a way and a highway. And it shall be called the highway of holiness. Oh, and there shall no unclean thing pass over it. <laughs> Hallelujah. No unclean thing. Said no lion will be found thereon. You know what that means? I'll tell you what that means. That means that these preachers who claim to be preaching holiness were genuinely preaching that highway of holiness. The devil wouldn't be nowhere around. Hello now. Because there ain't no lions and no unclean things on God's highway. Hello now. And if you're preaching people down God's highway, I'm here to tell you, you ain't going to be playing into the devil's hand and repeating what the devil's been telling them. Come on now. But you're going to be telling them something fresh and new and exciting and encouraging and inspiring that's going to lift them up out of that mess they were in and put them on solid footing in Christ. Glory to God. Whoo! Mankind's always trying to bring God down to human. You know, we're always trying to equate God with human nature. But my friend, I'm here to tell you, Jesus Christ came so that the divine nature could be revealed in human form. That was his purpose in coming. That was why he was here. 1 Timothy 3.16, we all know, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Hallelujah. John chapter 1.18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Matthew 1.23, behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call His name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Hallelujah. John chapter 14, 8 and 9. Philip said to him, meaning Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, Show us the Father? Hallelujah. John chapter 10, verse 30. Jesus declared, I and my Father are one. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you, my friend, that God manifested Himself to humanity in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And not one time will you see Him banging someone over the head. Hallelujah. Because they were an unbeliever. Not one time will you see Him accusing someone because they lived ungodly. Not one time, my friend, will you ever see Him coming against someone and causing them to walk away from Him feeling worse than when they came. Whew. You said it, brother. Whew. Glory to God. Not one time. <laughs> Whew, I won't shout a little. I'm just going to get happy. I'm thinking about that little lady at the well. Glory to God. 
go get your husband. <laughs> I don't have one. Been married several times, but the man I'm with right now, he ain't my husband. He said, you know, you, you described that well. That's all he said. He didn't say, don't you know divorce and remarriage is adultery? Hello now. He didn't say that. He said, you know what? That, that you, you described that nicely. He said, guess what, sweetheart? I know I'm diverging. Mm, mm, I know I'm, woo, glory. I know I'm diverging from the topic a little bit. We're, you, we were talking about husbands there for a minute. But I want to talk to you about something else. He said, it might seem crazy for me to go from husbands to this. But let's talk about water. <laughs> oh, we're here in a well. Hey, praise God. Let's talk about water. That seems to be a good topic for the moment. He said, I got news for you, sweetheart. If you knew who you were talking with, you'd be asking me for water instead of me asking you. Come on now. He said, because the water that I'm going to give, it's going to allow an individual never to be thirsty again in this lifetime. Glory to God. Ooh, Jesus had good news. My Bible said after his run-in with her, that little lady ran back to her, her little town and told them all about this man who had condemned her for being a hoe. Oh, no, he didn't do that. I'm sorry. She went back to her town and told them all about this man who accused her of, of living in adultery. Oh, no, he didn't do that either. Hmm. Hmm. No, she went back and told her little town about this water that this man was offering. <laughs> I'm telling you, friend, it's, you know, this whole gospel thing, the most exciting thing you're ever going to be part of. Amen. If the church would act right instead of being foolish and acting like a bunch of two-year-olds, if they preach the truth like they're supposed to preach the truth, God's church would probably swallow this world up in an avalanche. Amen. Half this planet would be Christian overnight. Amen. If the church would act right. Instead, we've got a bunch of idiots in the pulpit emulating the scribes and Pharisees of biblical record. Hello now. Amen. Oh, religious is all murder. But failing to recognize that the grace and love and mercy and salvation of God is unconditional. And that's guaranteed. Amen. Like old Vern used to say, whatever his name was, guaranteed. <laughs> Amen. I'm here to tell you the after effects of a relationship with the Master are often presented as prerequisites to having a relationship with Him. You hear me now? The after effects of a relationship with Jesus are all too often presented to us as being prerequisites to having a relationship with Jesus. You want to have a relationship with Jesus? Well, you need to quit drinking. You need to quit smoking. You need to stop whoring. You need to do this. You need to do that. Well, you poor, 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 misguided soul. You want them to quit drinking and quit smoking and quit doing drugs and quit hoeing around and doing all these things? Introduce them to Jesus. Because once you know Jesus, you'll never be the same. You're going to walk away different than when you came in. But my friend, to tell people that they've got to change before they can know Him is a misnomer. It's a lie from hell. It's a misguided notion. No, like I said a couple weeks ago, too many people say, you want the Holy Ghost, quit smoking. You want the Holy Ghost, quit drinking. You want to uh, get, over, uh, get over drugs and then you can get the Holy Ghost. And my answer is, you nincompoop. You need to get the Holy Ghost so you can quit drinking. You need to get the Holy Ghost so you can get over drugs. Come on now. You need to get the Holy Ghost so you can get your life on track. It don't work the opposite way. Hallelujah. If you could do it on your own, you would have. Hallelujah. My Lord, have mercy. Glory to God. 
I'm here to tell you that the after effects, what happens in our life after Jesus has become a part and parcel of our existence and our being, those things, my friend, are not prerequisites. God's grace, His love, His compassion, and salvation are offered without conditions. There are no prerequisites. Come on now. Amen. What can we expect from the Lord in response to our hearing His voice and responding to His call? When it calls us this wonderful gospel, this good news we preach, we can expect rest. Matthew 11, 28 and 30, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest. Rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy. Did you hear that preacher? My yoke is easy. Hello now. Did you hear that Christian? My yoke is easy. Serving God, my friend, should not be a heavy-handed, heavy-hearted, difficult experience. Jesus said, my yoke's easy. Let me tell you, compared to being out there in the world and living for the devil, living like a dog, I've been there, done it. I'll tell you, living for Jesus is the easiest thing going. Hello now. <laughs> Amen. I don't wake up with hangovers. Woo! I don't worship at the altar of the white porcelain goddess. Amen. Glory to God. I don't take my baths out there in the, in the drainage ditches alongside of the street. Amen. Oh, I'll tell you, living for the Lord isn't hard at all. Amen. His yoke is easy. Why? He said, come to me and I'll give you rest. Why is it so many people claim to be Christians? So many people claim to know God. So many people claim to be serving the Lord. And yet they don't have rest. My Lord, have mercy. Yet these are the same ones who tell me that in order for me to know God and love God and be a Christian, I've got to do this and this and this and this and this. See, they attach all the prerequisites. They attach all of the conditions. And yet the same ones who are telling me that conditional message, hello now, they don't have the things that Christ promised to those who would believe on Him and accept Him and receive His gospel. Amen. That tells me somebody don't know what they're talking about. Amen. That tells me somebody need to go read it again. Amen. What else? Love. What can we expect from the Lord? Love. John 3, 16, 17. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world. Did you hear that preacher? For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Ooh. Yeah, that love of God is unconditional. Romans 8, 35, Paul said, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Ha! Paul mocked those things. Ha! What's going to separate us from the love of God? Can you name something going to separate you from the love of God? Paul said, I don't think so. <laughs> you want to go down the list, you go down the list. He said, I don't think you're going to come up with nothing that's going to separate you from the love of God. David said, if I descend into the lowest hell, you're even there. If I ascend to the highest heaven, you're up there. I expect to see God in heaven, but I wouldn't think he'd be in hell. But glory to God, he is. Because God's love is wherever I am. Amen. It's unconditional. And that's guaranteed. Joy is something God has promised. Joy. How many Christians I know don't even know what joy is? Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Peace. I just... Give you one example there. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled and let it, uh, neither let it be afraid. These are all the things, Bruno, that we experience in response to our relationship with the Lord. Rest. 
love, joy, peace. Salvation. You know how conditional salvation is? Let me tell you. Acts 2.38. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all who are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Hmm. See, Peter didn't say nothing there about race. Hello now. He didn't say anything there that separated the genders. He sure enough didn't say nothing there that indicated that uh, there was a difference in God's opinion between one sexual orientation and another. I didn't hear him give a clause, except you're a man who dresses like a woman. Amen. He doesn't do, do it. Mark 16, 16. Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. See, the point is, it's about your faith. It ain't about your face. Come on now. It ain't about your wardrobe. It's not about your sexual orientation. It's not about your gender identification. It's about what you got working in here. It's about how you responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Have you believed it, accepted and obeyed it? Or have you rejected and walked away? Amen. Romans 10, 11 and 13. For the scripture says, Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, sounds to me like it's unconditionally guaranteed. Amen. I don't hear any conditions, Harry, do you? Amen. Some preach that the after effects of salvation actually include deliverance from the so-called immoral homosexual lifestyle. If you get saved and get the Holy Ghost, you won't be gay no more. Yeah, when you got saved and got the Holy Ghost, you were still stupid. <laughs> Amen. I'm not even trying to be mean. I'm being serious as a heart attack. You got people out there with an IQ of four, and they get the Holy Ghost, and I don't discredit the fact they got the Holy Ghost, but you know what? They ain't no Albert Einstein now. They still got an IQ of four. Amen. Hello now. Now, you know I'm telling the truth. Let me tell you what my Bible says the, the after effects of salvation will be. Galatians 5, 22, 23. But the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit, the natural byproduct of the Spirit being in your life. Fruit just grows. If the tree's healthy, the fruit will be there. You can't help it. You don't make it happen. It's there. If the tree's not healthy, there'll be no fruit. He said, but the fruit of the Spirit, if the Spirit is in your life and the tree is healthy, he said, then there's going to be love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Hmm. Hold on one second. I know I must have misread, misread this here. Well, I don't know. I'm looking as close as I can look, and I can't see it, but I'm, it's got to be there because I've heard it in my church all my life. <laughs> Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. I was sure the word heterosexuality was in there somewhere. I'm sure that somebody told me that if you get the Holy Ghost, you become a heterosexual. That's got to be a fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> oh, but what threatens the mainline churches today is the fact that by us being here and making every effort to serve God and live for Him, you see, we're, we're, we're really challenging them and aggravating them. You know why? Because what we're showing them is that love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, Goodness, self-control, kindness can all be part of a packet's life. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Hello now. I don't see why a gay man or a lesbian or a transgender person cannot exhibit the fruits that I read here. Do you? Come on now. 
I don't know. I don't see where it's impossible for someone who's gay, lesbian, and transgender to, to exhibit these fruits. I don't see it. To see heterosexuality is not one of the fruits. And that means one of us fruits can bear fruit. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Having some fun. Almost done. John 15, 4 through 6. I even got Harry to giggle on that one. That means I've done something. See, now I can, I can go to rest tonight with a... Lord, I did something good today. I got Harry to laugh. Amen. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch uh, that is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. You see... Bruno, what we need to learn in this community of ours, we can bear the same fruit. Come on now. But you got to do it the same way. you got to stay plugged into the vine. Amen. Don't walk away from Jesus and then expect to still have the benefits of serving God. Amen. Too many in our community have decided to walk away from God because of what church has told them and because of what preachers have said. And, and they miss, uh, later they miss that they don't have what they used to have in their life. Amen. When they were in the church. But see, the big mistake they make is, in order, they think in order to get back to that, that they've got to go back and meet man's conditions rather than God's. What conditions has God got? He had, he just said, as long as you stay plugged in, just like it's a natural principle. It ain't a condition. It's a natural thing. It's a law. He said, as long as you stay plugged in, honey, the juice will flow. <laughs> as, long as, you keep, as long as you keep the branch grafted into the vine, then it's going to bear fruit. Amen. It wasn't about conditions. It was about understanding how things work naturally, so to speak. Amen. Almost done. You can be whoever you are and still bear the fruit of one who is grafted into the vine of Christ. And the scripture teaches that it's the fruit of the tree that determines whether that tree is good or evil. Hmm. You hear me now? The fruit determines the state of the tree. Matthew 7, 16 through 20. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. It just can't happen. It's not that it doesn't happen. It can't. Happen. Did you hear me? It can't happen that a bad tree bears good fruits. So, Mr. Straight Preacher, if you don't like the fact that this little homosexual Pentecostal preacher bears good fruit, you better just turn your theology around and read your Bible one more time because a bad free it tree is incapable of bearing good fruit. Did you hear me? Say, well, brother, but you know, but people look at me, and 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 just because I'm gay, it don't matter what what fruit is in my life, but, but because I'm gay, they label me evil. They they label me all these bad things, sweetheart. They did the same to Jesus. That's why Matthew seven. That's this is the answer he was given them, because they looked at Jesus. And you know all those horrible healings and miracles he did. You know, I mean, oh, heavens. Whew. Oh, I don't know how that man was allowed to live as long as he did. But see, but they had labeled him evil. They were saying that he was doing his miracles by Beelzebub, prince of devils. <laughs> and this was his answer. Read it when you got time. Go to Matthew 7 and see what I'm talking about. You'll see I'm telling you the truth. This was Jesus answering them, accusing him 
of being evil and bad. So you see, you're not alone. <laughs> Jesus said, if they'll do it to me, they'll do it to you. Amen? That's why people need to get their skin toughened up a little bit. And I don't give a happy hallelujah what First Presbyterian has to say about me. I know what God's got to say about me. And when I go to church, I'm not worshiping First Presbyterian. I'm worshiping Jesus. Come on now. When I get to heaven, I ain't going to answer to First Presbyterian. I'm going to answer to Jesus. Amen. Glory to God. So it doesn't matter to me, Bruno. I couldn't give a happy hallelujah whether they understand that God's grace and mercy and love and salvation are unconditional and that's guaranteed. Doesn't matter to me whether they understand it or not. I do. Amen? Praise God. Amen. If you need the Lord in your life, if you want to reestablish your relationship with God, if you want to have what you once had, if you've never known God, if you've never had a relationship with Him, my friend, I'm here to tell you right now, come on without fear or hesitation. <laughs> don't, don't, even, don't, even, don't even hesitate for a moment. <laughs> because you will, be, you will be welcomed with open arms. There are no preconditions. And that's guaranteed. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. And I'll just throw this last comment in. The Lord's going to welcome you with open arms. A lot of churches might not. But the Lord will welcome you with open arms. And, and I got more good news. This church will do it too. Amen. 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 We'll welcome you with open arms. We'll welcome anybody who wants to know God with welcome arms. Amen. I don't care if you're a homely 55-year-old man in a dress and you want to worship and serve God, we'll pick you up. <laughs> Amen. Right, Harry? We'll go out there and get you if we have to. And uh, you better believe it. Amen. Because, you see, we, we either got to live this thing or, or, you know, we can be as hypocritical. We could be as hypocritical as some of the other churches are toward us, uh, in, in having an attitude toward others the way other churches have toward us. And that's something that Harry knows, and as long as he's been working with me here, I've said many, many times, I said, you know, we got to watch that. you got to watch that. One of the hardest things to deal with sometimes is folks who are transgendered. Some folks have a hard time, you know, dealing with it. Some people don't understand why Brother Mora can sit at the diner with somebody transgendered and it don't matter to me whether they're pretty or ugly. It don't matter to me whether they're dressed nice or dumpy. It, it, it doesn't matter, you know. Let me tell you something. There's not a one of us don't have a family member that's a little off their rocker. Amen. Amen. I know just about every family I know, you got that one uncle who's a woo, you know. Mm, well, here's Uncle Lee. <laughs> you know, you know, I, of course, I'm that member of my family. <laughs> but you know what? You love them anyway. Amen. Amen. When you go to family gatherings, when you all go out as family, you don't suddenly disown that person because you're embarrassed or ashamed to be seen with them. Amen. I'm here to tell you, when it comes to God's family, there ain't a, there ain't a soul in God's family that I'm ashamed of. Amen. Mm -mm. If they love the Lord. Then, then they are deserving of my love in return. Because after all, we're family. Amen. 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 And I pray that as Grace Oasis gets established and as we grow, that we will always have a mind to reach out to anybody and everybody that wants to know Jesus. Everybody. I don't care if you're straight, gay, cross-eyed, bow-legged, or blind. Amen. You want to know God? There's a place for you here. Amen. And I believe Sunday after Sunday that we're going to preach you happy. Amen. And help you to, 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 you know, there's an old song that says, lift me up above the shadows, plant my feet on higher ground. And that's, that's what every church service ought to be about. Amen. This preacher has made up his mind. And let me tell you, I didn't, I didn't used to be this way. Years ago, boy, when I was in the Pentecostal movement, I thought I was the slickest preacher going. I was hardest preaching son of a gun you ever heard in your life. I mean, man, I could preach it straight and hard, you know. But I'm here to tell you, boy, when God finally got through to me, when I finally 
learned what amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. When I ever figured out just how amazing God's grace is. <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm here to tell you. It made such a change in me that every message I preach is a happy message. Amen. Amen. Every message I preach is a hallelujah time. Praise God. And I told my mom when she said to me, she says, you know, uh, you know, every time you preach, she said, boy, I want to jump up out of that bed and just run in circles and I don't know what to do with myself. <laughs> and I said, Mom, that's what a preacher's supposed to do. That's why folks don't come to church. But you know what? People in our community, listen to me a second now. They're without excuse now. Mm. Do you hear me? They're without excuse. And the ones who are in worse shape than others are the ones who've been here. Because they know. Mm. You know I'm telling the truth, don't you? Because they know. They know that God is here. They know we tell the truth. They know we lift up, we don't beat down. Now what's your excuse for not getting behind this thing and making it happen? My, 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 my. I'm going to tell you, it's going to be, people always say they ain't no crying in heaven. The Bible don't say that. Don't you kid yourself. There's going to be lots of crying in heaven. On Judgment Day, when you stand before the Lord and He said, I wanted you to do this and you did that. Why did you do that? Don't you know there were 40 people who could have been saved if you'd have obeyed me and done what I asked you to do? And you know where they are now? They're in hell because you didn't do what I asked you to do. It's going to be lots of crying. Do you know that your family member could have been saved? You could have had your mother here with you today if you'd have done what I was trying to get you to do, but you wouldn't do it. See, the Lord's not going to stand there and rub it in our faces. No, 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 no. He's not going to stand there and, you know, here, let me show you what could have been. No, that's not what I'm saying. But you see, when we get there, we're going to know everything there that we didn't know here. So all the things we missed... We're going to realize over there. There's going to be a lot of crying in heaven. And my Bible said after the judgment that our God is then going to wipe the tears from our eyes. But in order for God to wipe the tears from our eyes, somebody got to be crying. Hello now. Amen. Say, so Lord, I don't want to cry. <laughs> I want to shout from the minute I get there for a good 10,000 years or so and then I'll stop for a day and then we'll start all over again. Amen. I don't want to I don't want to waste one second in heaven crying. I don't want to be looking at regrets. I want to do what God's called me to do. And I want to go into heaven on a, on a hero's reward. Amen. I want to go in there with with the angel standing at attention saying, "Son, whew, you did something. Man, you did something." God's standing up there at the throne. What you mean he's standing? He ain't sitting. No, he ain't standing. He's giving you the same standing ovation he gave Stephen when Stephen was being stoned. And Jesus just stood right up and said, Boy, come on home. You've done enough. You did a good job. He said, You endured right to the end. Come on home. I'm waiting here for you. Amen. Whew. I feel good. It's been a good Sunday. Amen. I think we have pretty good church around here. And uh, I just, let me tell you, we had a service a couple weeks back that was a blowout. We just had a wonderful, wonderful shouting time. We did. And we had several people more than we have now. And uh, But this is what we go through. People come and go. You know, instead of coming and staying, they come and go. <laughs> but, um, but I'll tell you, God meets with us every time. Every single time. And I think, if I can brag for half a second, I think we got a good thing going. Amen. Amen. I think we got a real good thing going. And uh, I, I don't feel sorry for us. I feel sorry for the poor nuts out there who aren't here. Amen. 
I feel sorry for the folks who are going to go pouring into partners tonight, you know, to get their drinks, and they couldn't find the time or the energy at 1 o'clock in the afternoon to go to church and be uplifted in spirit and know that God loves them and they can have a better quality life if they allow God in it. Amen. I feel sorry for them. They, they don't need to feel sorry for me. Hmm. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Would you stand with me at this moment? Amen. If you have a tithe or an offering, we don't pass the offering. Well, of course, there's so few of us. Why should we anyway, right? But we don't pass the offering basket. We just have it up here. You're welcome to, uh, if you'd like, to give a tithe or an offering. Uh, we welcome it. We certainly can use it. We keep our expenses pretty reasonable. We try to. But we also, excuse me, hmm. We also have uh, a lot going on. We do a lot. We do a lot more. I was telling Michael earlier, we do a lot more than people realize we do as far as the Internet and all this. we got a lot going on. And uh, we've been able to help refer people to churches all over the country, been able to send tapes to people all over the world, and we've even gotten offerings from people all the way in Norway and what have you because they, they love and appreciate our ministry. So, uh, you know, we welcome anyone if you're able. And if you're not, God bless you anyhow. I'm not going to hate you. There's no conditions here. <laughs> Amen. Did you get the message today? Yeah. Amen. I hope it's in I hope it's in your spirit, not just in your head. Amen. We gonna do the diner? Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Because we like to fellowship afterwards. We usually go over to uh, the Valley Diner, which is right here on 34. You pa probably passed it coming in. Because you came in from New Haven today, didn't you? Okay, good. Yeah. Well, we're glad to have Michael. I'm glad he's here today. It was an encouragement. Amen. And uh, let's just be praying for, uh, of course, Brother David, whom uh, he drops in pretty regular these days, so that's good, you know. So, uh, Olga and Heidi, I've got some cards going out to them. I have no idea what's going on with Jeff, you know, that, that situation. Yeah. Yeah, I gave him a call, but I haven't heard anything from him. Um, you know, so let's just be prayerful for those that are not here. And uh, also, I've tried calling Theodora several times, several times, and I never get an answer. I don't, I don't think so. I, I mean, I would, I would even. I'm thinking about maybe doing that at some point if I can find the police. <laughs> sharp little character, nice old man. He used to come to church. So, you know, we need to pray for Theodore and that as well. And uh, You know, uh, folks, just pray for the church that God will give us folks. Uh, it's, it's not, you know, it doesn't do anything for my ego. It's not about ego. It's, it's about, we all benefit, first of all. We all benefit. Did you notice the difference in the service the other day when we had the group that we had? And the reason that it's different is God is able to move differently depending upon the, the audience, you know, who's there. And the larger the congregation, a lot of times what you're doing is, it's, it's like broadening what the Lord is able to do and how the Lord is able to move. The bigger the, the, uh, the audience, uh, then the more God is able to do. And you'll see the gifts of the Spirit moving, and you'll see things happening. You know, uh, God will be able to do these things. But when you just have this little tenency number of people, then God is working with him because he's, he's tailoring it to you. My message is different today with those of us here than it would have been had this room been full. Absolutely. It's very different. It's not because I changed it. It's because God changes it. It's the way the Lord lays on me. You see, if the room were, were full, then it would have been applied differently. The Holy Ghost would have had me to deliver it differently. I might have preached that message screaming and hollering from one end to the other and dancing all over the house. I don't know, but you see what I'm saying? It, it depends. It depends on... That's one reason why it's so important, you know, that we all bring our faith into the space. You know, and that you get as many as possible to come because that's, 
That's how you ensure the widest possible uh, move of God. You know, that ensures that God can do the most He can do because there, there's such a wide array of people and what have you. Amen. So, let's just bow our heads. Lord, we love you. We thank you, God, again for this wonderful day. We thank you for the message. We thank you, God, for your word. We just ask, Lord, that you would allow uh, the message that was delivered today, simple as it was, Lord, that it might be applied to our hearts. God, that we might walk away from this place and dwell upon it, think about it, and Lord, allow it to become a part of us. Your love, your mercy, your grace, your salvation is unconditional, and that's guaranteed. Lord, go with each and every individual that's made the effort to be in this place today. Bless those that are uh, giving, those that are unable to give at this time, so that at some time in the future, Lord, they might be in a position to do so, that this work might go forward for your glory. Lord, give us a church, give us people, give us souls for our hire. Help us, Lord. We want to experience all that you have to offer. We want to see the gift.